Okay, it's slowed down a bit, so maybe we'll get started. Okay, good evening, everybody, and welcome. Uh, my name is Norman Blumenthal. I'm the director of Trauma, Bereavement, and Crisis Intervention for Our Children's Home and Family Services, one of the three organizations that are sort of co sponsoring this event together with the Hebrew Academy of Long Beach and with NCSY. Um, where the title of tonight's talk is Teaching from the Front Lines of Our Living Rooms, Supporting Teachers in Extraordinary Times. And our focus uh, will be on the impact on teachers and the, not, not even so much on the students, we'll talk a little bit about the students, but the impact on teachers of the numerous stressors of having to teach uh, from your home uh, and help students and ourselves cope with, the, with the, all of the cumulative stress and pressure that exists during this COVID-19 crisis. Uh, as a colleague of mine likes, likes to say, a colleague of mine likes to say, uh, five out of four psychologists don't know math. Um, there is a math to stressors. Uh, if you would take three stressors and they all have a value of two, two plus two plus two does not equal six, it equals 36. Or as my mother, Leo Shalom, who was a Holocaust survivor with the treasure trough of Yiddish sayings, used to say, I'm going to translate in English out of respect for Yiddish, but there was a saying she had that when a poor man has a hernia, there's a pimple on it. And uh, there are a lot of pimples uh, that we're addressing, and I hope tonight we'll be able to address some of those issues. Together, presenting along with me is uh, Carly Namder, who is the Director of Guidance for the Howell Middle School. And then the last, um, oh my goodness, I just got signed out. Uh, am I still there? You're still you're there. You're good. I'm still, still there. there. You're I, good. You're good. I'm good. I don't see myself though. How did that happen? Let me a second. Give me a second. Um, I'm still. I'm still. You still see me? This is very strange. I'm sorry. Well, um, give me a second and find out why this. I just suddenly got signed out. Um, meeting. Hold on. Very, very strange. I just got signed out um, and I can't see what's going on. Hold on. Oh, here we are, I'm back in. That was interesting. Okay, um, you see me perfectly, okay, thank you. Um, so the, the um, okay, so again, uh, I will be addressing some of the trauma and emotional piece and uh, <clears throat> the other presenters will be present, uh, 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 Mrs. Namder will be presenting on ways to cope and manage and, and Robert Josh, uh, Josh Greyjower, who's Director of Day School Engagement for New York and New Jersey, NCSY, will talk some more practical, uh, pragmatic, pedantic types of approaches in terms of teaching students under these circumstances. Um, it's a large group, so I, all of you are muted. Um, what I would suggest, and we're up to about 80 participants, so what I would suggest that if you have a question, please use the chat uh, uh, option at the bottom of the page and enter your question, and we will try to answer the questions as we go along. Um, in, a, in addition, if for some reason you get unmuted, please remute yourself, or if you want to say something, uh, if you want to uh, say something verbally instead of through chat, other chat, you can ask the questions privately if you want, so not the whole group would know uh, what questions you have. Uh, if you will unmute yourself, please remute yourself. It's sometimes very hard to recognize how disruptive background noise is when you're in the room as it is to the, to the Zoom group. Um, okay, in fact, we already have one comment on chat. <laughs> okay. Um, Okay, no problems. Okay, let me let me get started. Um, and by the way, also I you know I always feel compelled at these points to not only to thank the three organizations and all of their their various leaders, but also to thank the tech the tech department that makes this possible. Try try to imagine what it would be like if we didn't have the access to Zoom and all these other uh, resources. Um, okay, so I want to just begin by maybe describing in a sort of very global way. Uh, what is happening with this uh, corona coronavirus crisis. And it's interesting that there is really a distinct progression in terms of what's happening. When this all started, when this first broke a few weeks ago, uh, the focus, first of all, I don't think any of us really knew the severity 
of the crisis, but the focus was very much on hygiene and teaching hygiene and preventing and, and having sort of a, a sense of anxiety of proportionate with the risk that existed, although we were, um, I think, underestimating the risk that existed. Once quarantine became the norm and people were, uh, had to stay home and students had to stay home and we began this whole strange process of the remote teaching, then the focus very much became on the stress of quarantine, which is a distinct stress. And uh, very creative and almost, I would say, frenetic attempts to preserve the communal connection, the sense that we're still part of a school or part of a community, et cetera. There was a, a flurry of activity, of events, and of Zoom meetings, et cetera, trying to maintain and hold on to that very important communal and academic connection that we all have. What's happening now is I, I see three changes taking place all of which I think are significant and significant to our conversation. One of them is that we're settling in. And in fact, uh, some of the questions we've gotten ahead of, ahead of time even reference that. We're kind of getting used to it. Uh, we're getting used to uh, this new way of living, being confined to our homes, uh, connecting via uh, online, Zoom, Skype, whatever, and even the children. Now, the novelty of the remote education and connection is wearing off. Now that's a mixed blessing. Our human capacity to acclimate is really a blessing because in many situations when we're feeling very threatened and we're feeling sort of thrown out of place. Um, one second. Okay. Uh, <laughs> all right. I'm just checking. Uh, Okay, oh, that's not important. I'm just going to check the message. So the, the, um, our acclamation is a blessing because we can take extreme circumstances which happen from time to time and make it the norm. Um, and this helps us adjust and cope. So the very fact that this has become more routinized and has become sort of normalized is, as I said, a way to a blessing in disguise. However, it also has runs risks. In fact, some of the research on being quarantined demonstrates that when people re uh, return to the uh, their social community, um, I'm gonna just make sure everybody's muted. Okay, once they return to their their social community, that they have a hard time at reacclimating to social life and to communal life, and that might st be something we have to think about. Maybe if we have time, we'll also try to discuss what it'll be like when time comes to go back to school and go back to our community, it may not be as easy as we think. It might not just be going back to something familiar. It's going back after a period of time where we have sort of become hermits in many ways, and that this, we might take this with us. And I think that might happen with the children as well, that this day we've gotten used to shorter days, they've gotten used to this compromised way of teaching, and they've also got used to being isolated. And the, the reacclimation might be difficult. So that's one of the, changes that's taken place and something we have to take into consideration, hopefully, as, as this crisis subsides. The other uh, issue that we're seeing a lot of, unfortunately, is a lot more grief now, as, as deaths uh, increase and many people losing loved ones. We have uh, a lot of the focus has recently been on the unique type of grieving, the, the very deprived and compromised grieving that's taking place because of uh, the limitations of what we can do in terms of uh, funerals and burials and even shiva. So that's been a focus. In fact, we are now, OHO is currently running, I think it's up to four support groups, uh, uh, bereavement grief support groups for people who have lost loved ones, or lost actually parents. We haven't even started, we weren't in the planning to start one who lost, for people who have lost uh, spouses, but for people who have lost parents to the coronavirus. So that's a, a very big focus now. And of course, the, what the fallout will be, not only the current impact, but what the fallout will be when, when we don't have access to the normal type of relief, the type of access of consolation that we have through these commemorations. And the third thing I'm seeing, which is interesting, is I'm seeing, a, in, in, and mostly I would say among children and even adults, who, are, who have ADHD or other kind of dysregulatory disorders, that there's a restlessness, almost the opposite of what I'm seeing with the majority of the population, that they've just about had it. 
with being confined and being deprived of their regular daily routine and people who had adhered to the conventional standards of social distancing and minimizing, um, act, you know, leaving the immediate home are starting to take more chances, are starting to take, get a bit more reckless out of a sort of restlessness and accompanied sometimes with a cynicism about the what's uh, about these restrictions and uh, so we're seeing both extremes at this point now in terms of the of your role as teachers and again i'm going to keep my remarks succinct um first of all and i have to emphasize this and i hope i'm not going to be saying in an inadequate way what my subsequent presenters will be discussing but the role of the teacher has changed radically way before even the coronavirus as a result of technology the teacher as just the purveyor of information, the one who gives over lessons and imparts information is no longer relevant because anything you know and that you could tell you the children, they can click a mouse and find out more. So the, the, the techno technology which has changed every aspect of life, uh, way beyond sometimes that which we're aware of, one of the ways in which um, the world has changed uh, because of technology is the teacher today is not just in part of information. The teacher is a deputized therapist. The teacher is the one who takes information, tries to put it in a meaningful way. But more and more, in terms of the context of my address, is we're recognizing that teachers are taking more responsibility for the emotional well being, not total responsibility. That's why we have mental health professionals at schools and mental health professionals to be referred to, but more responsibility for the social and emotional adjustment of the children. And we, as the mental health professionals, are training teachers. We have a very exciting program with HALV, in which we've done uh, with regard to anxiety, which we're working together and in many respects. Uh, training teachers to work with levels of anxiety that they can address uh, because that's the new role of the teacher and I know that Robert Gray Chow is very much involved with that in uh, MC Sway's initiative now to work with, with schools. So you're going to be responsible for during this time period not only to try to maintain your role as the teacher and to teach content and cover whatever you can in terms of the syllabus but how, what kind of impact the uh, quarantine, what kind of impact the multiple losses, maybe for many of your students, the losses of grandparents is having on them. Um, now, the other thing I just want to say in terms of how I look at this remote learning, and I'm not sure everybody will agree with me, but I'll, I'll sort of put it out there. I think given the amount of stress that there is and the limitations of this type of education, I'm encouraging parents, particularly if it starts developing into areas of conflict, uh, I'm trying to tell them that the goal of remote, the primary goal, let's say, of this type of remote education is to maintain the connection with the teacher, um, maintain the connection with the Mora or the Rebbe, if it's in, in the Jewish schools, and just to impart to the children how education is still important, and education is still part of your life. The ex amount of material that is covered, I think, is secondary to that connection that's established. And I think that relieves a lot of tension, both for you as teachers, and I think it also relieves a lot of tension for the students and for the parents. Um, and in many, we, again, we're fielding a lot of questions, a lot of calls, and we're doing a lot of these kind of webinar groups. And when issues comes up, come up where there are, there may be conflict as a result of children not fully adhering to the demands of school or not taking it as seriously as they should under these new circumstances. If that's gonna to lead to conflict but in the home, I would rather forego the education and preserve the, uh, the familial harmony, which is not what I would say necessarily before all this, but when you are confined to your home, when you're cooped up in your home, and some people are cooped up in very small homes or apartments with many children, it's more important that there is a harmonious relationship and a, bed and a peaceful connection than actual material covered. In fact, one group I was running where, uh, again, a, a, a parents have to be a group for parents of children with, who are emotionally and cognitively challenged, and she was describing how she's fighting with her kid for how much he's on the various devices, and I advised her to get a little bit more lenient and avoid the fighting. I even promised her that once this is all over, I'll help her kid get off the devices. That is, if my wife can get me off my devices, uh, and uh, we'll, we'll, we'll do, but that's, again, we're, we're lowering the standards for the sake of a harmonious home, and we're, we may be lowering the standards for preserving the, the relationship between the teacher and students 
uh, so that we don't totally lose the momentum of education. Um, okay, now, the other issue which I'm not, other people are going to address is it's certainly also much more difficult for you as teachers uh, to keep your two worlds apart. There is a distinct benefit of the fact that school is in the school building and home is in the home building. And even though sometimes they overlap, sometimes you have to call parents from home and, and sometimes, uh, you know, you get a call in school because of something about your children, it really helps when they're in two different places, when they're, con when they're combined in your home. Maintaining that boundary is, is much more difficult. Um, okay, now in terms of some of the stress and some of the trauma and particularly some of the losses that, that children are experiencing, and again, that'll be very much, may fall in your rubric, it may fall into your, into your uh, you know, in, in your role as a teacher. Um, we have to make some differentiations developmentally. Um, elementary school age children, uh, generally speaking, do not want to stick out. They don't want to be distinct. They, they want to be much more part of the collective group, a part of the, the child culture. So a child, I'm going to say roughly from first to about fifth grade, even if there has the members of the family are sick, even if they had lost one or several grandparents, um, even if they, they, the stress of being home or the pressure that comes along with it is weighing on their minds, they're probably going to try to keep it hidden because they don't want a spotlight on them. Now, one of the things that happens when you try to suppress an emotion, as all of you know, it, it doesn't, it ultimately explodes. It ultimately comes out and usually erupts very abruptly. And this is what we very typically see even in the classroom with children at the, uh, elementary school age children, that those who may have lost a parent or have suffered otherwise will go out of their way, go to great lengths to prove how normal they are. If I visit a child who's sitting children for a parent and I tell them, I'm going the next day to your schools, anything you want me to tell your classmates, almost in very inevitably, they're going to tell me, treat me normally. I don't want to be treated differently. And they really go out of their way to demonstrate that. But then, as I said, because there's a cumulative effect of the pain, it may erupt. Usually what we recommend if that happens in the classroom is you try to universalize the experience. In other words, if a child bursts into tears in the middle of the classroom, instead of going over to the child and saying, Oh, I feel so bad for you. Maybe you want to speak to the school psychologist, which just sort of humiliates them more. We usually recommend something collective, something joint. So if your sense is that a child is demonstrating stress, is crying for no reason, is looking particularly agitated, and if, let's say, you point it out to the child and he does identify having a very hard time with the current circumstances or having just lost a loved one, then what's very, you know, what would really be helpful and it's can be done online is to do something collectively online, whether it's some sort of commemorative prayer, some sort of special learning dedicated to the memory of the person, whether it's universalizing the saying that you're not the only one. If the pressure and stress of, of being confined to your home, and it's even sometimes useful selectively to share that, that you feel this way as well. It's preying on your mind as well. Uh, this may, takes the spotlight off of him and it can become a shared experience that other people can, other children can share it as well. By the way, for children who have experienced losses in this age group, in the elementary school age age group, they take very kindly to the concepts of, uh, I'll say them in English and then translate uh, in Hebrew of the, of the hereafter, of the resurrection of the dead and the soul, or of Olam Havad and the Shama and Tachia Samesim. Um, these are concepts that works, work well for them. And if there is uh, an issue of a loss, and especially if you're the Judaic studies teacher and it very naturally fits into your, uh, into your teaching, then that's a, a topic that will work well for them. Not doesn't work as well for teenagers. By the way, I purposely actually see a preschool teacher here that I'm familiar with, but I'm not getting into, hi, <laughs> how are you folks? The, the, uh, the preschool, I just don't have time. If there are issues regarding preschool age children and loss, please contact me directly and I'll, I'll help you with that. Teens are going to be more likely to be openly expressive. Teens do not mind being distinct. Um, and sometimes they even like being distinct. So they may be more expressive and openly expressive about their pain, about about their struggle. Um, it, it might even take on a contagion. 
Uh, one of the things that happens in adolescence, again, without going into great detail, but the adolescent develops the capacity to be empathic rather than just sympathetic. The teenager already has from developmentally the capacity to exper experience the world from someone else's perspective. And that breeds, especially in young teens, middle school, sometimes a sort of contagion. So if a few children, and first of all, they're in touch with each other, with each other ready through social media. So if a few of them are already um, brooding, are uh, preoccupied with the pain, with the losses, et cetera, they can feed off of each other and you can have this much more of this collective, sometimes exaggerated response. Um, for the Judaic studies teachers, this is the age where theodicy or why bad things happen to good people may be raised or they may try to integrate the notion of a kind God with a period of time now in which we are suffering. This would be a classic kind of adolescent issue. Uh, and usually what I advise teachers, it depends how it's brought up. If it's re they're really struggling with it, then you're certainly you're in a better position than I am to discuss it with them. Sometimes with teens who like to be distinct and rebellious, they bring it up only because they know it's the unanswerable question. And if they want to give their, their uh, Judaic studies teacher more gray hairs and wrinkles, this is the way to do it. Because it's much, that's, that's if you want to question a, a religious convention and belief in God, this is the area in which you can. And if it has a rebellious flavor to it, then usually I discourage a collective conversation because anyone who's on a soapbox certainly wants a, an audience. Um, okay, I'm going to skip a few more points. Okay, just one or two more points because I do want to give the other uh, presenters a chance. Um, please shy away from, especially for the Judaic studies teachers, some of these heroic stories of great people who in the past endured terrible suffering and maintained their composure and even their level of happiness and, and did not allow the external imposition of suffering such as the Holocaust and the Crusades and other, I mean, we have, and those, you know, in Jewish, we have, in Jewish history, we have a rich history of suffering and, um, you know, and we're able to endure and not let it affect them in any kind of uh, uh, way. It, it, it just, it doesn't speak to us. There are great people who have done amazing things, but most of us, most of our students are not great people. If you want to tell a story, it probably is much more useful to tell a story of an important person or a rabbinic figure or a heroic figure who did suffer, who did have a very hard time and somehow managed to adapt and adjust. That'll be more useful than some of the more heroic stories that suggest a total invincibility, which may exist, but for only very few people. And, and, and two more quick points, which I'm going to touch upon, and maybe in discussion we'll have time to talk about it some more. There is a concept called secondary trauma. Secondary trauma is the trauma that you experience by hearing about somebody else's trauma. So whereas being quarantined and the fear of the illness is something we all share, there are differences to the extent to which fatalities and such death, and for that matter, how severely the illness has impacted in the home, there are differences. And if the students talk about it, or if you're dealing with it or addressing some of the losses and some of the trauma with the students, you're gonna feel traumatized. And in a strange paradoxical kind of way, secondary trauma is more corrosive and dangerous than primary trauma, because primary trauma, you know you're supposed to be traumatized. If somebody has, God forbid, lost a loved one, they know that it's painful and they know they've been traumatized and they haven't been able to say goodbye or the person was hospitalized for weeks and they didn't see them. All these types of experiences we know are traumatic, but we don't expect to be traumatized by hearing about it. And therefore that trauma, and also that trauma is cumulative. It's not the one story, it's the 20th story. So if you're addressing this on a regular basis with your students, beware that it's gonna sort of insidiously creep into your mind. And you may have to address it and you may become traumatized yourself, even if in your immediate surroundings, you are not so profoundly affected. And then a point that I alluded to earlier, but I think bears repeating, I think uh, in light of the fact that it seems that we have passed the peak of this crisis, that we're now, even though it's still dangerous and we still have to be quarantined and exercise social distancing, there are hints that we're beginning to emerge from it. We, there's a lot we don't know. That's one of the issues also is the ambiguity. I didn't get a chance to get into that, but there's a lot we don't know and whether it will recur next year or not, but there might be, we might be getting closer to the resumption of communal life and maybe even resumption of school and in, a, in the school building. And I, I think it would be a misnomer and a mistake to think that we're just gonna fall right back into it as if we just 
you know, we're home for a few days with the, with the flu or something like that. There's going to be a hard adjustment to get back into the communal life. It'll be a hard adjustment for many of our students to get back. In fact, by the way, and I'm just going to get allude to it quickly, there are some students for whom this has been a real blessing. Uh, there are certain kids for whom school, who are a misfit in school for a host of reasons. It could even be because of intellectual precocity. And being home has been really great for them. So, uh, but besides that subgroup, they're, they're, it'll be hard to adjust back to communal life. It'll be hard to go back. We're not, we're not gonna go back. We're gonna have to go forward. And I think as the various schools, institutions and teachers have to be prepared that there has to be some reacclimation to school life and to communal life when that happens, and I hope it happens very soon. Um, at this point, I'm going to hand the uh, podium over to uh, to my colleague Carly Nemder, who runs the uh, his director of guidance for the Howell Middle School, um, who will talk further about uh, adjustment and empower empowerment for teachers. Okay, Carly. Okay. All right. <clears throat> okay. So first, I just want to begin on a note of gratitude. I want to just um, I just feel incredibly privileged to join with everybody here tonight and um, be surrounded by such a group of incredible educators. Um, I'm incredibly grateful to OHEL for the work that they do and, and feel really privileged to be partnering with them in the work that we're doing at HALB. Um, and also to the Jewish Education Project who, who is part of this, who pivoted so uh, wonderfully and providing so many resources now to teachers and schools and, and educational communities. Um, I'm going to, I have a lot to cover. I'll, I'll get through whatever I can get through. And if you want to contact me afterwards, feel free to email me, cnamdaradhelp.org. So I was preparing for tonight and thinking about what I could possibly put together. And I, I thought back to the beginning of the year at my daughter's, uh, my third grade daughter's parent teacher conference. And her teacher opened up by saying, you know, welcome to the school of life. And I feel like those words really resonated with me at the moment. I feel like at the moment we've all transitioned to teaching in a school of life and we're learning so many life lessons, learning so much about ourselves, learning so much about our students um, and, and all that's going on in between right now. I just think we all have to give ourselves a lot of credit for showing up. It's 9.30 at night. You've all been through a long day. Um, and, you know, it takes a lot for, for you to come on right now. And there's plenty of other things you could be doing. So I wanted to say thank you for, for coming. Uh, my professor, Dr. Novik, said it so wisely when she said that, you know, teachers are really lifelong learners and they are models of resilience for their students, showing up day in, day out, um, through whatever you're going through in your own personal lives is just a real model of resilience for your students. And I think it's really important as educators, I know that, you know, we're so used to giving of ourselves to other people, but I think it's so important for you to reach out to the supports around you if you need. And I, I really hope that you have those supports available to you. So if it's really important for you to reach out to the people around you in order to help you if, if you need. Um, I thought it would be helpful to kind of put it out there, some of the emotions and some of the stressors that I think people are going through at the moment. I think that this is really based on, on the material that I've been reading, my conversations with people from, from lots of different kinds of networks. And in the week of March 23rd, um, just days after the US Surgeon General put out um, the notice to stay at home, the Yale Center for Emotional Intelligence conducted a survey um, and they reached about more than 5,000 people worldwide. And they asked people to describe how they're feeling in their own words. words. More than 95% of the words that people use reflected unpleasant feelings. And the top five words were anxious, fearful, worried, overwhelmed, and sad. And there were only about 6% of people in that sample that actually mentioned positive feelings, like feeling hopeful and feeling grateful. It's a month later or more than a month later. And I think I'd be very curious to know what, how people would answer that survey right now. But some of the emotions and some of the things that I think are floating around right now are, are fear. You know, will I be okay? You know, what about my family? People are angry. People are frustrated. People are wondering, you know, uh, why didn't our schools prepare us better? Why didn't we close earlier? People are frustrated. You know, the parameters of them as teachers is, are a little murky right now. And people are having difficulty, real difficulty juggling 
their teaching, their, their personal lives, their children's Zoom schedules, um, you know, then there are, there are a myriad of other things that people are dealing with. People are feeling vulnerable. Brene Brown talks about that a lot. You know, many of us don't have experience as technicians, um, and that's not how we enter the field as educators. And people are worried about how their ability to navigate technology is affecting their ability to teach. Um, and also people are, you know, anxious about how much they're giving of themselves and how that's affecting their ability to give to others who need them as well. Um, there's a lot of, I think, compare and despairing going on. I think people are looking out there and seeing that, you know, there are other people who seem to be managing this so well. Um, and people are going through all kinds of other things and not necessarily wanting other people to know about them. You know, there are many masks that we wear as educators. And I think it's really important right now to have a little more self-compassion. There's also, there's loss of control. There's disappointment over missed milestones. There's dealing with our students who are upset and, and nervous about, you know, what about our graduation and stuff like that. People are feeling very distant from their loved ones and not knowing when they'll physically be able to see them, especially those of us with family far away. And then there's also the fear of, you know, it, contracting the virus and how that's going to affect us and, um, and everything that we're living through. There was a great article in um, Education Week called Exhausted and Grieving, Teaching During the Coronavirus Crisis. And it talked about stress at a whole new level. And it spoke about some of the stresses that teachers are going through. And I think that um, many people here may be able to relate to that. You know, the constant spiral of communication, whether it's from, you know, administrators, parents, teachers, um, you know, and we just can't seem to sh be able to shut it off. And then we get the condolence emails and then we get the guidance emails, you know, the emails from the guidance department that tell us about which family situation we're supposed to be, um, we're supposed to be sensitive to. I know I'm totally upfront here by saying that it, it's taking me a lot longer to write my emails because every time I'm putting something um, in an email, I'm trying to imagine, you know, trying to be sensitive to the person that's on the receiving end and how they're going to be able to relate to it, considering what they are personally going through. And then there are people that are, you know, teachers are haunted by the article calls it the no shows, the kids that aren't showing up on their screens and wondering what's going on for their, for their students. Um, and we may not know. Um, I was talking to an, an, an incredible colleague today and she was telling me that, you know, we just may be the next target that, you know, people have their people that they unload on and teachers sometimes fall prey to being that target. We're just another person for people to offload the things they're upset about. Um, so one, one thing that, that really resounded with me is by reading this article is seeing that, you know, the, the stress that people are under and the, the way things have just changed so rapidly and so quickly, it's actually possible that we've kind of been shifted. Our brains have actually shifted from being able to do higher order thinking tasks to just switching into survival mode. And yeah, we might shut down a bit and we might space out and we might become a little more hypervigilant and we might be checking our emails and, and trying to respond to everything. And it might, might be hard to concentrate. So I want to talk about a few strategies and a few things to keep in mind for more of a positive uh, frame of mind and how we can try and, and keep that balance. And again, I don't necessarily know what every person's personal situation is. There is no, you know, no, nobody wants to be told what to do or how to handle this. Everybody's just doing the best that we, they can. And that's important for all of us to remember. Um, there is, by the way, a whole area of research that talks about uh, stress as being an enhancer, um, stress actually having something called the stealing effect, that it actually can promote greater resilience, um, if you're interested in looking into that. There, there, just, just as another aside, there was a great article um, talking about the concept of emotions being contagious. Um, negative emotions are extremely contagious. You know, you can spread them, uh, and we don't even realize that we're we're in this trap sometimes and um, it can spread via, you know, text messages, WhatsApp messages, um, emails that we get. Um, and I think now that we're home and we're isolated, we may actually be even more susceptible to that, that negative 
emotion contagion. So it's something to keep in mind. Um, I think it's also important to keep in mind for you to notice what your triggers are. For example, um, you know, I, I was getting messages about, um, you know, all the things America did wrong. You can tell from my accent, I'm not, I'm, I'm Australian originally. I was getting messages, um, you know, about all the stuff that America had done wrong and, and um, so, you know, getting some messages about Australia not knowing when they'll let Americans in and when, when we'll be able to, to travel and all of that. And I just had to have a very upfront conversation and say, I, I really can't look at this right now. It's triggering me. Please, please stop. And I got it to stop. But it, that was something that I had to do because I noticed that that was a trigger for me. Um, so I, I want to just say that talking about emotions being contagious, the same way that negative emotions are contagious, um, positive emotions are that much more contagious. Meaning that if you set yourself up for experiencing these positive emotions and you shift yourself, and we definitely are able to shift to more of a positive mindset, then um, that can spread and actually go viral. You know, a spread of positive emotions can lead to greater cooperation, less conflict and much improved performance. But I, I personally think that, that we can, st we can jumpstart that with a little more self-compassion. Um, you know, I, I just spoke about managing composure. Um, I'll talk a little bit quickly about um, a concept called post-traumatic growth before I get into, um, you know, regulating and switching over to something that's a little bit more positive. There is this concept of post-traumatic growth. There is this concept of moving forward and, and shifting beyond this. And one of the things that helps so much is a concept called acceptance coping. And I think that that is something that that is so relevant to everybody here now. Coping, knowing that there are certain things that we cannot change. Um, and right now, there are a lot of things that we can't change. So we can't change the situation we're in. We can't change the regulations that relate to social distancing. So what can we control? What is within our circle of control? Um, you know, this may be even as simple as waking up in the morning, setting yourself a goal setting yourself a wish of something you want to accomplish that day. Um, I do something and I've done this with my students at HALB. They all know this language. It's called WHOOP, wish, outcome, obstacle, plan. You set yourself a wish for the day. You imagine in your mind what, what's the anticipated outcome you have for yourself. What's the obstacle that's getting in your way? And then you make a plan. And there's lots of great techniques that you can use to just wake up day by day, setting yourself your goals and trying to get through what's within your day as best as you can. Um, solution focused thinking, you know, it is something that can really, really help um, is, you know, what is, what's within our control? What are we able to get through today? And um, emotional disclosure, you know, having the ability to share openly with other people and to share safely with other people and feeling understood. Okay, there's a, there's a great quote, um, as you grow older, you'll discover that you have two hands, one for helping yourself and the other for helping others. It's important, as educators, we give a lot. It's important that we also experience validation. It's important that we're not just giving, giving, giving. It's important that with the feelings that we're feeling, um, we are able to listen, to, to, to feel that we are being heard and being validated. Um, okay. So having good emotional hygiene at this time is really, really important. I mean, that means, you know, being really aware, taking your emotional pulse. You don't have to be able to deal with everything now. It's okay to say, you know, I'm going to deal with this later. This is what I have to get through right now. I'm just going to talk quickly. I'm keeping an eye on the clock on some things that we can do to really positively boost our moon, mood. Um, give yourself permission to be human. Um, this is a Tal Ben Shahar idea and allow yourself to experience a full range of emotions. Our emotions flow through a pipeline. We want to make sure that all emotions are okay and we can express them. Just because you are expressing your emotions doesn't mean that you're, you know, they're, you're allowing them to overtake you. You can be fully functional, but it's important for you to, if you're feeling anxious, express it. It's okay to feel anxious. You know, it's okay to go through, you know, a lot of what we're going through. Um, and sometimes it helps to put it out there, even with your students. Um, 
there's really, you know, no criterion of correctness when we're talking about emotionally regulating. Um, expressing gratitude is really important. You know, when we appreciate the good, the good appreciates. There are so many, uh, so much research to show us how when we feel gratitude, we actually relive a positive experience. And then when we express it, we strengthen our relationships with other people. Um, Self-care is super important at this time. It actually can boost our immunity um, and it really, really, really can help us. Investing in relationships is super important. We're not wired to be isolated. We are wired to connect. You know, we, a lot of us talk about this idea of fight or flight, but there's also this instinct that we have called tend and befriend. You know, when a child is, is upset or when a child is worried, they're hardwired to reach out to hold a hand of an adult or to reach out to someone else. I think it's really, really important for people to reach out to the people around them. I know that, um, you know, the networks in my school, thank God, are in Halber are amazing. The, the, the way that the teachers are supporting each other and what they're doing is really, really incredible. And I have a feeling that the way that people sought support before this is how they'll continue to look out for support from other people. You know, people are bouncing inspiration off each other and it's, it's really, really incredible. Um, just wanna say a little bit about social media. It can be wonderful and it can be really inspirational, but it can also be a bit of a downer. I think it's really important for us to just, um, to be real with ourselves. And, um, you know, there, there's a quote, comparison is the thief of joy uh, by, I think, um, Theodore Roosevelt said that, you know, it's really important to gauge your emotions as you're going through your own, whatever you're looking at online and really, um, really be in the moment, really, really make sure that whatever you're engaging in is really, really helping. Um, I, I, I don't have much time left, so I'm just going to skip quickly to just talk about this idea of strength-based resilience. There's a lot of research. There's a new wave of uh, research in positive psychology all about strength-based resilience and this idea of dipping into your strengths and how that really, really helps to promote thriving and promote flourishing. And the more that we tap into our strengths in the work that we do, the more that we look out for things like that provide us meaning and purpose and we use our strength and bring it to our work, the more, um, you know, the more satisfaction we feel, the more optimistic we are, the more engaged in our work. And I've seen some incredible things from other educators that are really using their strengths and bringing them to the, to the work that they're doing with their students, especially now, um, and how it really is giving them a much needed boost. And, and you know, it's really, really a wonderful thing. Um, so I'm gonna hand it over now to Josh and we'll be available for questions at the end. Okay, thank you. I got it. Um, okay, thank you so much. Um, you know, it's really, a, I'll, I'll repeat the same opening for a second. It's really a, an honor to be here with uh, both Dr. Blumenthal and Carly. And uh, there's a reason why I'm third and they were uh, first and second, but uh, I'll try my best to add to what was uh, said. Um, first of all, um, I just want to start and really um, acknowledge how hard this is. Um, in order to acknowledge how hard it is, I would like to show a quick video and a shout out to my mother, who I believe is on this call, who sent me this video. Dr. Blumenthal, if you could quickly um, show that video um, that we um, that I sent you before. Can you do that? I don't think I can do it. Oh, I can do it. Oh, hold on. Shoot. What? Oh, I can do it. Okay. Do, you want, do you want what? me to do it? Okay, you want me to do it? Uh, uh, I can do it. I just okay. uh, what? Hold on. Do you have it up? I thought you had I have, it. I have it up. I have it up. Let me share. Let me do what it. I'll share. Okay. Let's see. I thought I had it up. Hold on. Hold on. I'll, I'll get it. It's. Oh, it's not going for me. Hold on. Why is that? Okay. Hold on. Maybe you should okay. do it then. I, I'm sorry, it's not. Just pressing. Okay. I'm pressing and it's not. I probably didn't load it up right. 
Okay, here you go. Okay, you got it? Okay. Okay. Uh, uh. All right. As much of the world continues on in isolation, people working from home, they're trying to figure out things to do with their family, uh, things to figure out how to pass the time. Yeah. Linz and Kels, a lot of oh. teachers have been going online and coaches trying to trying to help out their students and, and their athletes. Um, this one teacher in particular, music teacher, I thought was phenomenal. Not only did she pick up an instrument and decide to help out her student and spread some joy, but she wrote a song and as inspiration, she was going to share what she's been going through and how it makes her feel sure. while she is in isolation. Have a look. Hey, so as some of you guys might know, I'm a music teacher and I found that one of the best ways that I can process the whole transition to online learning and teaching is to write a song. So I wrote a song. I'd like to share that with you guys now. Here we go. in preparing for this um, for this uh, session and it really uh, struck a chord with me and I'm sure it struck a chord with many of you here. Um, so I'm just going to start by saying that this is uh, this is really hard. Um, it, it's really hard as a, I am personally a classroom teacher. Um, it, it's really challenging to teach in this uh, in this way. First of all, uh, as a teacher and many of us on this call I think can appreciate, uh, Online learning and classroom learning are not the same, and our training is not in online learning. There's special people that are trained in online learning. Um, it, it's adjust to that in, uh, you know, literally uh, from one day to the next, you know, for us on Shushan Purim to shut down school and basically two days later to be on Zoom. Um, it, it's a totally different experience. It's not the same thing. Uh, again, people I know are at different ages, different stages of life here, but if you have little kids at home, to be managing your little kids while teaching a class, while cleaning your house because you don't have cleaning help anymore, um, you know, if we're if we're stuck at home alone and we don't have anyone with us, so there's a challenge in that. There's so many different challenges um, that exist right now. So first of all, it's really hard. Um, that's number one. Number two, um, I once heard, um, I believe it was from the author of the book Freakonomics. He said that if you buy a parenting book and you read it, chances are you're a good parent. I mean, the only people that are reading parenting books are the people who are already probably invested in parenting enough to read a parenting book. So if you're here on this call tonight, uh, chances are you're doing a good job because you came to a to a you know to a to a session at nine o'clock at night after a long day after many hours of struggling through whatever you struggled through today. I um, mean you're here, which means that again, chances are statistically speaking, those of you who are here, the 113 people that are on this call right now are probably doing a good job. So don't uh, I, again my, for me it's like don't feel bad about yourself. I'm sure you're doing a great job. Um, the main things I want to focus on in the short time that I have, uh, I guess, are twofold. Um, the first is, um, in general, in education, um, it's really important to focus on what our goals are. Uh, where are we headed? What are, what are we trying to accomplish? Or what are we doing? Um, and, and it's really important that if we're, if we're adjusting, as we said, to online learning in a new platform, in a new way, with our kids running wild around our houses and with our, you know, so many different things going on, it's really crucial and important to understand what our goals are right now and how we should be thinking about that. Now, again, I can't speak on behalf of your schools and the different places that we teach, um, but I'll just speak personally for me what I've kind of tried to do in terms of adjusting my goals. Um, and some of it actually is really just, um, you know, kind of hyper-focusing on some of the things that should be our goals all the time. And we'll talk about that in two different ways. But I, I think it's really important to kind of think about what our goals are. There's a quote um, that I, I'm going to guess many people on this call are familiar with for me. It's the number one quote um, when it comes to education in general. I think right now it's even more apropos, which is Maya Angelou once said, I've learned that people will forget what you said. People will forget what you did, but people will never forget how you made them feel. And I think right now, um, again, more than any time, really, I, I think it's true in every day of education, in any classroom, whether it's live or online. Um, but right now, I really think um, the, the social emotional part of learning and kind of the way that we're interacting with our students is so much more important than the concept that we're trying to teach. It's modeling, as I think, as Carly said, really, I think correctly, it's modeling the resilience, it's modeling a certain uh, attitude towards what's going on, it's modeling being in touch with our emotions. You know, I, there are days that I have started my class and I have said, like, I am having a really tough day. You know, it was a rough morning, my kids were, you know, all over the place. You know, I'm really, it's really hard for me to be here right now and do this. 
And again, I, I don't find this to be a sign of weakness or a sign of saying that it's not healthy to share. I think it's very healthy to share with our students sometimes in the right way with a certain tone of, listen, this is hard. And, you know, we're all struggling through this and it's not abnormal to be struggling, but be able to be modeling both the struggle and the ability to be resilient and to show up to class and to teach our classes and to be prepared, um, to me, is really at the core of what's going on now. And to have that as a goal, um, again, to see why we're doing what we're doing and to remember our role in, their, in these kids' lives. You know, again, for some kids, I imagine that the Zoom calls and the, and the work is, is a big stress. And for some kids, I imagine it's like kind of a reprieve from everything that's going on at home and from, you know, just having some sense of structure. And I think it is really important to kind of see our role in that, in that way uh, as classroom teachers, as people that can really give that to our students. And there are many ways in which we can kind of give that over to our students. I'm just going to share, again, a few things. Um, that I try to do, um, it, it's not easy, and some of them, some of them are easier, and some of them are harder. The one that I found easier, uh, which I don't do on a daily basis in a regular class, um, I greet each kid by name on the Zoom call, and I try and give them like a little bit of a joke or something about, you know, personal to them. Again, I, I don't do it in a regular class. I take attendance, I guess, on a regular day, but I don't really, you know, look at them in the eye and kind of focus on each person individually. And I think it's really like nice. To kind of give our students that feeling of like, you know what, I'm, I'm saying good morning to each one of my students and good afternoon, whatever time my class is, but to give each one of our students kind of that, even if it's three seconds of personal attention, again, so especially right now, um, I think is a really crucial thing. Number two is to be able to kind of um, check in with them um, outside of the class. Um, again, it's, it's not easy. Um, I'm a classroom teacher myself balancing a lot, but if we can, you know, try and check in with our students, if it's a quick email, if it's a quick set up a personal phone call once a week, uh, wishing them a good job, is, um, whatever it may be, but those small gestures go a really long way in showing our students that we care about them, not just we care about the fact that they learn in their Flemish, their social studies, or whatever it may be that we're teaching, but to give them that sense of, you know, that real feeling that we care about them. Because as I said, you know, people will forget what you taught them, um, and especially now, people will forget what you taught them, um, but they're not going to forget how you made them feel. They're not going to forget the tone that you set in, in your classes right now. And I really think that in this, in this difficult period, um, there's a real opportunity to model for our students, um, you know, kind of how to, how to get through a difficult situation, how to really um, persist and to, and to stay focused and to stay structured and to stay positive, as, as Carly was speaking about. And I, and I really think there's a huge opportunity, again, in terms of education. Um, I know for my own children, again, I'm, I'm not speaking now as a, as a teacher, I'm speaking as a parent, you know, that for my own children to get that from their kids, you know, from their teachers, uh, it is really of the utmost importance, much more than, again, the details of the Rashi or the, uh, you know, the, of the details of America, but the ability to kind of feel you have that social emotional piece really be taken care of and really be focused on. Um, to me, it should be a focus of all of our education right now. And again, for those of us who are in the classroom, we can appreciate um, how, how, how much our kids are really seeking that right now. They don't have their social outlets that they normally have. They don't have a lot of what they normally have in terms of structure. And to feel that they have a, a teacher um, you know, who, who looks at them and, and, and treats them that way and is in touch with the emotions of what's going on right now, um, I, I think is really crucial. Um, that, that's kind of the first um, part that I want to focus on. The second part um, is something that I'm passionate about in education in general, but it's clearly been highlighted in this time. And it's something that, um, again, I hope uh, it doesn't stop after, after Zoom ends and after we go back to our classrooms. Um, but what Zoom has highlighted um, I think for, for anyone who's teaching, and, and, and it has to highlight, is that students can't just sit there uh, watching us for 30 minutes, 40 minutes, an uh, hour, two hours, or four hours straight. It's just not possible. Um, again, it, it, on Zoom, it's that much harder, um, but in the classroom, it's, it's not too easy either. I think, you know, in the classroom, it's, it's more disguised sometimes with the ability to go out to the bathroom, with the ability to move around, and they misbehave more, and there's less misbehaving when you can mute them on a the screen. Um, but to have kids just stare at a screen and listen to us talk for 30 minutes, um, again, uh, not to be too straight, but to be honest, it, it's not effective. Um, and I think that the best way as, as a teacher, again, just for literally, I think, three minutes right now, I'll just share, uh, we need to be a little bit trying our best. And I know it's really hard, and I know that um, it's, a new, it's a new model, and while we're balancing a new model of teaching, we're also you know, balancing a million things in our own personal life. Um, but if, in whatever time that we can, whatever way that we can, to kind of have our students be actively involved in what's going on, uh, to me, is, is really important. I'll just give a few small pieces of advice, some things that we can do like on a daily basis. Um, and some things that may be a little bit, you know, more brave and take a little more. So again, some of it is like literally calling on kids, um, you know, calling on kids individually to answer things, uh, even though they're on a Zoom and they're far away, not waiting for them to raise their hand, 
call on kids, you know, give them things that they can answer. Maybe you don't have to put them on the spot to embarrass them, but call on kids. Have every kid in the class speak at least once during a class. Have them write down, uh, you know, answers on a piece of paper and hold up a paper to the screen that everybody can see it. Uh, Zoom itself uh, has reactions. If you see on the bottom there, it has reactions and you can have them react to it. But that, I think to have them write it, physically write down on paper and hold it up to the screen is, again, a way of getting them actively involved in what's going on in the class. I, I assume some of these are obvious, but, you know, breakout rooms, if you haven't used breakout rooms on a Zoom meeting, um, they are effective. I use them almost on a daily basis in my classes. Kids do use those rooms to really kind of interact with each other and to talk and to be engaged with what's going on. Um, again, there's a lot that we can do. Um, again, smaller things. I, I don't think this call is geared towards teachers of younger kids, um, but scavenger hunts and you know, stretching activities. And my son in his fourth grade class had like a game of charades, uh, which he loved. It was like really exciting. Um, again, things that get the kids moving and really engaging in that way uh, is, is really, really helpful. I'll just share, uh, you know, very quickly for those who are interested, uh, I, I recommend you do the research. There are also things that you can do to kind of make learning a little more asynchronous, meaning to give assignments of things that kids can do and, and then report back to you. Um, if, again, I know schools feel differently about different things, so I'm not telling you based on your administration, but things like ed puzzle or screencasting, where you can make a recording of yourself teaching, um, are, are very helpful. There are a lot of different tools that you can use. There's not one or the other. I have to be a big fan of ed puzzle for anyone who's never used it. It's kind of like you can use a video and, in, and embed questions throughout the video, and you can see the students work as they're going. But there are a lot of different tools that we can use to give students things to do. We can give them projects, we can give them things to work on. Um, but I, I think what's been clear in terms of teaching um, is that as teachers, we can't just have the kids sit there and watch us talk. Um, again, I don't think that's effective teaching in a regular classroom, but in a Zoom classroom, it's certainly not effective. Um, and, and it's really important to kind of reflect on that. And I know, I want to emphasize, I know that this is a really hard time and, and we're dealing with so many different things. And so right now, kind of focused on um, you know, new ways to teach while we're in the midst of all those other things is really hard. But I'll say the flip side of that, um, which is that, again, when there's an opportunity in front of us, and kind of what Carly was saying about being positive, um, it's hard to feel positive when you don't feel like you're being effective. And the more that we feel that we're being effective in our classrooms, um, the easier it is to stay positive. So in a certain sense, while it may be more time consuming to put in the effort to make our classes better, um, again, like on a daily basis, when we put in more effort to make our classes better, we feel better. So again, as hard as it may be, and I'm not saying it's easy, and I'm stressing myself, my classes are not perfect right now at all by any stretch of the imagination, but as hard as it may be, the days that we're able to put in that effort to find the extra time to do it, um, it is really helpful. I'll just make um, one, one last note about um, being a teacher with kids. Um, again, I've just found helpful uh, for myself. I can't, I don't know if this will be helpful for any of you, um, but uh, I found that managing device time, um, both for my kids watching while I teach and for them being on Zoom all the time. Um, so I've just found personally, uh, again, this may not be the right advice, but it's what worked for me. Um, it's not so much a matter of like how much time is being spent on a device, but when the time's not on a device, um, I try and be very present with my kids um, because it's very, very hard to, um, to always be present while we're working full time and having them be in school and manage all those things. But the times when we're not on devices, we're all not on devices together. Um, and it's much more helpful, I find, that we eat lunch together, we take an hour break in the middle of the day, and we all eat lunch together, uh, you know, at, at, you know at, at afternoon slash dinner time, we try and really find, carve out a real chunk of time. Again, some days, I'm being honest about my own work, some days that's, that, that's a half hour, you know, some days it's two hours. Um, and, but when, when we're not on devices, um, I, it's really helpful to kind of be present. And I found for myself, at least as a, as a source of comfort, because I know that it's, it's really hard to, to do all this, um, but... Um, but to kind of find that time to be together with our family or managing, you know, everything that's going on in our own homes um, it is really helpful. Um, I have more to say, but our time is kind of limited. So I'm going to hold it at that. Um, Carly, I'm going to pass the floor back over to you. I don't know if we're going to do some questions or, or, or end it. your call, Carly. Um, I... Dr. Blumenthal. Yeah, I mean, our time is up, but people can, can leave. We're not taking attendance. So, uh, you know, people can leave if they have to. Maybe we can spend, we started a little late. Maybe we can take some questions. There were a few questions on the chat. Yes. Yeah. So, let me, so let me, maybe, maybe I can um, you uh, actually. Say, do you want me to answer yeah. this question quickly? Yeah. Sure. Um, so I, I'll just answer the one that was posted about, um, about using um, breakout, breakout rooms. Um, I give work every day in a regular classroom. I'll give work for the kids to do kind of in partners. 
So I'll give worse for them to do in a breakout room. Um, I will say is like a small thing that's important. Don't break them up in rooms of like two because often there's like technical issues. I, I tend to break them up here in a classroom. I break them up in rooms of two. In on a Zoom, I would break them up in rooms of like four or five. Um, that way there's a little more people at a time. If one of them has to go to the bathroom, whatever it may be, they have trouble getting in with the technology. Um, but I give, I give assignments almost every single day. And you can go, if you break, once you use breakout rooms, you can go from room to room. You can join each room and kind of switch off rooms. Um, again, and I found, again, again, same way in a regular classroom, they're not always working, but I found the students actually do work during that time and they, and they enjoy the break of like kind of having stuff to do and not just the time to listen to, to me talk. So I found it effective. Okay. I think there were also some other questions that about uh, what things you referenced. Uh, there was a Ed question. Puzzle, of, yeah, I'm sorry. Yeah. What wasn't, um, yeah, I think that one was answered. I said Ed Puzzle, yeah. So oh, did he say Ed Puzzle? Yes, he did say Ed Puzzle. Okay. Um, Okay, somebody mentioned that they, well, so they, like, everybody sees this is out to everybody. Um, okay, so people an are article. sharing. There was an article yeah. I was asked to reference, and I, I don't have the exact link now, but I just put down what that article is. Somebody else asked me about the concept of uh, resilience, strength-based resilience. Uh, you can you can search that up. You can also contact me, cnamdar at help.org, if anybody has any questions or if I can help you in any way. Um, there was a question that related to somebody asked about the post-traumatic growth and, um, you know, some of the benefits of, you know, what we can expect for children to come out of this with. Um, and there, there is a lot of research that talks about um, some benefits of, of, of you know, post-traumatic growth. It's hard for us to say if this is, you know, what we're going through. I think we're living through a process right now. I heard Dr. Pelkovitz say that somewhere else, you know, it's really unprecedented. Um, and it's it's not something that we have a lot of reference. We can compare it to other other things that have been through. But there are five known um, benefits of of post traumatic growth. Um, I'm a doctoral student, and I'm doing some research related to this. So there's you know a renewed appreciation for life. Um, people have found new possibilities for themselves. People have also found increases in spirituality. They're more spiritually connected. Um, their relationships with people have improved and they've really um, felt more personal strengths as well. I think, you know, some of this is bringing out strengths in people. People are, are leaning into their strengths. Um, I think as educators also talking about the concept of resilience, it's really important to, there, there's a famous study um, that many of you probably already know about. It came out of Emory University where a whole group of psychologists um, found that children who knew more about their family's history, um, you know, that those who spent more time with their families were actually, um, actually came out to, to score a lot higher on resilience measures. I think the more that we, you know, lean into our family's history of resilience and we think about, um, and we look out for stories of resilience, stories of inspiration that we can dip into, it gives us a boost that we need. I mean, look at, look at, uh, okay, now, now we're down to 80, but we had like 120 people on this call. That's, that's a lot for people who've been, you know, educating all day. Um, you know, so I think it's really important for us to, the same way we're leaning into the, the social networks and the supports that we have in place, and hopefully people are, you know, it's important to keep in mind and, and spotlight and highlight stories of resilience and, and look for inspiration because that really does fill us up. Um, so I did want to mention that because I saw there was a question related to that. Um, so any other questions? I don't know about Josh or Dr. Blumenthal, if you've got anything else. There were questions sent in beforehand, if you want to, uh, I, think, I think we're good though. I think it's, you know, I, I think we should call it a night here. That's my, I feel like it's long. Okay. Okay. Um, also, by the way, maybe we'll, we'll share our contact information uh, yeah. on the chat. So if people have any additional questions, I'm going to, I'm going to post mine and maybe uh, Carly and Josh, if you can post yours and then uh, so people can contact us. Um, yeah, whatever Josh wrote, feel free to email me too. Okay. 
Oh, one second, I'm trying to. What do they want to do? Uh, 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 Wish all of you okay. best. For of some reason, some reason it's not going. Okay. Um, my, my email address is Norman underscore Blumenthal at ohlfamily.org. That's uh, Norman underscore Blumenthal at ohlfamily.org. For some reason, my the email is not. Uh, I'm not having a very good day today. <laughs> okay. They Google any of our names. I'm sure they'll find our email. Okay. Right. Right. Okay. So thank you for coming, everybody. It was thank you, everyone. Very, I learned a lot, and um, good luck. And I hope we'll be back in our classroom soon, and in good health. Nice. Okay. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Uh, my email is uh, Norman underscore Blumenthal at OLFamily dot org. Uh, Norman underscore Blumenthal at OLFamily dot org or Doctor and Blumenthal at gmail dot org. Uh, dot com, either one. Okay, have a good, good night. night, everybody.